Over the past 20 years, no archaeological site has attracted more public excitement than the early Neolithic site of Gobekli Tepe in Turkey. Until excavations there began to uncover spectacular buildings with huge T-shaped pillars, no one suspected that such monuments were even possible at such an early date, roughly 10,000 years ago. Its original dig director, Klaus Schmidt, argued that its builders were semi-nomadic hunter-gatherers who congregated there for rituals. But ideas about who actually built this site vary from ones that are pretty reasonable to ones that are quite fantastic, with some people arguing that only some advanced Ice Age civilization, previously undetected by archaeologists, must have been responsible. Others go so far as to associate the site with mysterious watchers of the Old Testament, or Anunnaki of Sumerian mythology, who some authors even claim were extraterrestrial visitors. Today, I'll review some of these theories and the evidence that's presented for them. Gobekli Tepe is a large early Neolithic site in the Sanlıurfa district of southern Turkey. Level 3 at this site, probably dating roughly 11,000 years ago, features a large number of circular to oval structures, each with two massive pillars near the center of the room and smaller pillars around the periphery. The pillars are T-shaped slabs of limestone, often massing up to several tons and many of them are carved with reliefs of animals and other symbols. The original director of excavations at the site, Dr. Klaus Schmidt, argued that the site was a pilgrimage site that drew hunter-gatherers from a broad region in order to conduct rituals in the structures, which he described as temples. Although archaeologists would describe this as an early Neolithic site, the late Dr. Schmidt emphasized that he thought that the people who used the site were hunter-gatherers, not farmers. And when these hunter-gatherers congregated at the site, perhaps seasonally, they would have carried out construction activities as well as rituals. As Schmidt originally thought that there were no permanent residents at the site, such congregations would have provided the labor required to raise the pillars, as he thought that at least a couple of hundred people would have been required to move and erect the largest ones. Among the startling conclusions that Klaus Schmidt popularized about this site was the idea that agriculture was not a necessary precondition to the formation of organized religion, but rather that societies with religious specialists arose before agriculture. In the last two decades, many sites similar to Gobekli Tepe have been discovered in the region around the site, indicating that Gobekli was not unique. But for many people, the question remains, is it plausible that simple hunter-gatherers could have built such an amazing site as Gobekli Tepe, not to mention the other sites around it? For some authors, it's simply implausible that hunter-gatherers, even if they numbered in the hundreds, could have built such structures. Some of them would have you believe that it would require some more advanced society, either to erect these buildings themselves or to instruct the local hunter-gatherers in how to build them. For some people, the obvious candidate is some extraterrestrial civilization. And some authors would connect these extraterrestrials with the Anunnaki of Sumerian mythology. But even shows like Ancient Aliens present yet another candidate. They instead attribute such works to some lost pre-Holocene civilization, sometimes considered to be the origin of the legend of Atlantis. Andrew Collins would like you to believe that this ancient civilization has something to do with the watchers of the Book of Enoch, and that it's also associated with the Garden of Eden. Although last time I checked, the Book of Genesis doesn't say anything about Adam and Eve building large megalithic structures. Another author who argues for some lost pre-Holocene civilization is Graham Hancock. As these arguments go, this advanced civilization was wiped out by a cometary impact or a cometary burst that triggered the Younger Dryas climate episode around 13,000 years ago. Two authors, Sweatman and Zygritzis, would even have you believe that one of the pillars at Gobekli Tepe is an astronomical chart that shows the date that the comet impact happened. However, none of the arrangements of other images at Gobekli seem to have any connection to constellations. And even the arrangement on Pillar 43 is a pretty poor fit to the constellations that Sweatman and Zygritzis cite. 
Not to mention that it's a bit of a stretch to expect the builders of a Gobekli Tepe 11,000 years ago to have recognized the same constellations as the ancient Greeks 9,000 years later. It makes even less sense to attribute Gobekli Tepe to some technologically advanced civilization of the Pleistocene that archaeologists have simply been too incompetent to detect. Despite their success at finding lots of evidence for hunter-gatherer sites of the same period, among the many problems with these theories, the first is that it involves some very negative assumptions about the abilities of hunter-gatherers. Generally, these authors seem to think that hunter-gatherers are extremely unsophisticated. Second, they depend on Klaus Schmidt's hypothesis that Gobekli Tepe and sites like it were not Neolithic villages. And third, they also make some unwarranted assumptions about the level of difficulty involved in moving and erecting these large T-shaped pillars. Let's deal with each of these problems in turn. The idea that hunter-gatherers would have been unsophisticated goes back to 19th century ideas about cultural evolution. Authors like Lewis Henry Morgan contrasted what they called savagery with civilization which they viewed as the apex of human evolution. Even in the mid-20th century, when V. Gordon Child made his list of the characteristics of civilized societies, some of those characteristics involved monumentality, such as large temples that would have required large amounts of labor to build and maintain, and scientific knowledge, including astronomical knowledge. As evidenced, according to some authors, by alignments in the architecture at Gobekli Tepe. But this rather outdated contrast paints a rather poor picture of hunter-gatherer-collector-fisher societies, almost in line with Hobbes's idea that prehistoric societies would have lived lives that were nasty, brutish, and short. This prejudice does not give proper credit to the abilities of hunter-fisher-gatherer societies, and portrays them as the grunting primitives of popular culture rather than the highly knowledgeable people that they were. Hunter-gatherers of the late Pleistocene and early Holocene were in fact highly sophisticated. They had complex tools and weapons made of multiple parts made from different materials, of which archaeologists normally only find the parts made of stone, bone, or antler because the parts made of materials like wood and twine would have decayed away. These people were also capable of bringing down large dangerous animals like bison or oxen and even mammoths. And they no doubt had technologies for the transport of heavy materials like meat, hides, and even flint for raw material for sewn tools. And we know that some of them had seagoing watercraft capable of making fairly long voyages. For example, the Mesolithic occupants of Frank de Cave in Greece were exploiting deep water tuna and obsidian from the island of Melos, both of which would have required sailing far out into the Mediterranean. Even more remarkably, the first humans to reach what are now Australia and New Guinea more than 40,000 years ago would have had to cross straits that are more than 90 kilometers across. And it's also well known that among what some people call complex hunter-gatherers, such as the people on the northwest coast of North America, they not only knew how to erect large plank houses, they were also able to carve and erect truly enormous cedar totem poles and house posts. They most certainly did not require the intervention of some lost civilization that has since disappeared without leaving a trace of its existence. In short, many hunter-gatherer societies had considerable practical knowledge and technical ability. But we also have to ask ourselves, were the builders of Gobekli Tepe actually hunter-gatherers? That claim by Schmidt was dubious right from the start, in part because Schmidt misrepresented the character of early Neolithic villages and in part because he downplayed some of the evidence from Gobekli Tepe itself. In fact, one of the more common tool types at Gobekli Tepe consists of sickle blades, which occur in the tens of thousands at the site. And although such blades could be used for a variety of purposes, 
One of their most common uses was for harvesting of crops like wheat and barley. Other artifacts that are ubiquitous at the site are various kinds of grinding equipment, including mortars, pestles, and grinding slabs. Again, tools like this are multifunctional, but one of their main uses would have been for grinding seeds. And recent research by Laura Dietrich on the uses of these tools confirms that indeed some of them were used for grinding plant materials of the family that includes barley and wheat. In addition, of the tens of thousands of butchered animal bones in their fragments found in Gobekli Tepe sediments, many of them belong to mouflon or wild sheep, which could have been managed or on their way to domestication. Finally, many archaeologists and architectural historians now agree that even the large oval structures were probably roofed, while there are also smaller structures that are almost certainly early Neolithic houses. Taken together, all of this strongly disputes Club Schmidt's claim that the site was not a Neolithic village, especially when we make comparisons to sites that archaeologists accept as uncontroversial examples of early Neolithic villages. In the vast majority of these sites, evidence for morphologically domesticated plants or animals is very rare to non-existent, not qualitatively much different from Gobekli Tepe. And that's probably because the process of domestication took several centuries, as some recent genetic studies have begun to show. Furthermore, domestication aside, the behaviors associated with farming and stock raising did not simply supplant hunting, gathering, and fishing. Even by the middle phase of the pre-pottery Neolithic period, circa 8000 to 7500 BC, at most sites from southern Turkey to the southern Levant, only about half of the bones that archaeologists find belong to domesticated animals, namely domesticated goats. Typically, there are very high percentages of hunted gazelle, as well as significant numbers of bones from oroxen or wild cattle, from wild donkeys or onagers, and from wild boar. There are also remains of turtles and hares and other small hunted animals. In short, hunting was still a very significant aspect of the Neolithic economy. Of course, hunting continued long after the Neolithic as well, in part to supplement the highly agrarian diet, but also as a source of recreation and prestige. But in Neolithic societies, even if hunting was in part for prestige, it also contributed significantly to the economy and diet. In the context of Gobekli Tepe, it's meaningless to talk about hunter-gatherers or farmers. In reality, their economy was based on a mixture of hunting, gathering, and the harvesting of cereals. And these cereals were in the early stages of domestication. In fact, more recent excavations at Gobekli Tepe have actually identified morphologically domesticated cereals. So we now have even better evidence that the people of Gobekli Tepe were involved not only in hunting and gathering, but also in farming. So, the answer to the question that's the main point of this video is that the people who built Gobekli Tepe were apparently Neolithic villagers, presumably ones that lived right at the site itself. And we do have ethnographic evidence as to how villagers with relatively simple technology can erect structures like the Gobekli Tepe ones. In fact, one of the examples that Klaus Schmidt cited was the example of the Nias Islanders. On Nias Island, now part of Sumatra, people lived in large wooden houses supported on massive wooden posts, sometimes intricately carved. But they also sometimes moved massive blocks of stone, similar in size to the biggest pillars at Gobekli Tepe. Klaus Schmidt claimed that this required the efforts of a couple of a hundred of the villagers. Although, to judge by this photo from around 1915, it looks more like about a hundred adults and perhaps a couple of dozen children. And we should keep in mind that one reason for including so many people was that this was part of a public celebration. Rapa Nui, or Easter Island, is another place where people have demonstrated that they can move and erect huge sculptures without modern technology. Early research showed that small teams of men could carve the large statues with stone tools. It would just take them a really long time. And research by Tor Heyerdahl in the mid-20th century showed that even teams of less than a couple of dozen men could raise one of the statues by
by using stones and long levers. But Heyerdahl's early research appeared to indicate that it would take almost 200 men to drag one of the statues across the plain on a sledge. Only later, when he followed locals' advice instead of imposing his own ideas, did Heyerdahl discover that it was possible for very small teams of men to move the statues in an upright position by means of ropes, effectively walking the statue across the plain. Returning to Goveke Tepe, in an article I published in 2011, I made estimates of the amount of labor it would take to move some of the larger T-pillars at Gobekli across a level surface, using standard engineering formulas. These conservative estimates result in labor requirements that are not trivial, but are far below those that Schmidt suggested. And even if it was necessary to move the stones up a slope, say of 8 degrees, it would only require double this many laborers. In short, the work of Gobeke Tepe's residents is quite impressive, but well within their own capabilities. Whether they use methods similar to those on Easter Island, or ones similar to what you see in this image. To summarize, hunter-gatherers of the late Pleistocene had lots of practical knowledge. And it's unfair to characterize them as being incapable of moving large rocks around. In any case, to characterize the people at Gobeke Tepe as hunter-gatherers is simplistic at best. Like the residents at other early Neolithic villages, they would have had economies that included a mixture of hunting, gathering, and the harvesting of wild wheat and barley. And although their works at Gobeke Tepe and elsewhere are impressive, they most certainly had the practical knowledge and technology to carry out these works themselves. As I've tried to argue here, there is no good reason to invoke extraterrestrials or lost civilizations as the planners and builders of Gobeki Tepe's architecture. Almost certainly, Gobeki Tepe was an early Neolithic village, with a population of a few hundred residents that provided more than adequate labor for quarrying, moving, erecting, and carving the pillars. Such residents were neither full-time hunter-gatherers nor full-time farmers, but, like those at other early Neolithic sites, pursued a varied economy that exploited diverse resources, including wild ones and ones that were domesticated or on their way to becoming so. And they would have been perfectly capable of understanding how to move and raise large blocks of stone with levers, fulcrums, wedges, ropes, and possibly rollers. Their work is certainly an impressive achievement, but not at all out of the scope of these resourceful first farmers.